Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Harebrained Games, The Week in Games. This is a weekly segment I do apparently every month and a half now. It has been a while. I've had to take some time away from my usual recording and low-budget editing to do some world things, life things. Uh, lots of stuff going on, lots of juggling. You know, God is good, but I've had a lot of stuff happen that I've just had to deal with life-wise. We've all been there, haven't we? Uh, I had a lot of new subscribers in the last month. I don't know. I had a, I put out a video and got some subscribers that are great to meet all you new faces as a general rule. Like, this is really low-key, low-budget. I'm not here to compete. I'm not here to make money. I started this a few years ago with, for some buddies locally, and it kind of grew from that. I've met a lot of nice people all over the globe uh, who just... Are really awesome really nice we love to talk about games and I, I make it a point to try and read and comment on every single comment I get because they're all very valuable um, we're into the last bit of May it's been sweltering heat I love it uh, nobody else around here does but I love heat we've been into the 80s and uh, even touching on the 90s in, in sot so very strange May I know a lot of you are having different weather patterns too particularly not on the heat side but on the cold side so um, um, yeah, so it's been great. It's been great for my exercise. Uh, hasn't been too great for me having any motivation to mow the lawn, uh, especially since I had to fix the mower, and I hate that, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, enjoying life, enjoying everything that's going on, and I hope you guys are too. Uh, it's staying later, lighter later, so that means more games, right? Maybe not. Anyway, let's get to the news. In sad news, my favorite uh, and closest online gaming store, Fun Again, has finally, again, kicked the bucket. It shuttered its doors and sold off its games and is no longer uh, just involved in, in anything, anything Kickstarter or anything storefront. I did get a few deals before it left, um, but uh, man, like it's it kind of bums me out because it was the closest and fastest shipping that I had. But you know what? I suppose I might survive. I think I have some things to do anyway, but anyway, for those of you who don't know, I've got a, what was it, Game game Nerds and Miniature Market and Card House have been top-notch. Cool stuff kind of fell off the radar. They had some, they just really haven't stepped up late in the last couple of years, and so I've just been not using them. Um, but you know, other people have had great experiences, but, but yeah, I mean, anybody else got any recommendations for great online game stores? I'm all ears, so... Uh, lots of 2022 Game of the Year awards have come out. Uh, I, I, I kind of like, I used to be annoyed when, the, you know, usually right at the end of the year you get the best games of 2020 and then a few months go by. And then the second group with a mindset that's like, why don't we wait a few months and actually play the games from 2022 that came in right at the end of 2022, which is often times a lot more games than there used to be, and then do that. So I get it. I understand it. Um, every year I do a video or two or three or ten about top games of the year before. And I think maybe over the past five years, maybe once I actually put them up. Because by the time I get them done and get them in there, I'm like, haven't we already already had everybody give their game reviews? And so every once in a while I will do it, but I don't make a true habit of it. But uh, anyway, in other news, uh, Legendary Encounters Matrix is coming. Now, Legendary Encounters is done by my friend Devin Lowe, who I worked with years ago at... Uh, on a game for superhero Marvel, Marvel Superhero Squad Online. He was a tremendous game designer, and uh, both uh, analog and digital. And uh, over the years, this system, he's not involved with this, but over the years, that system has evolved to include other topics than just the original Marvel. And uh, Matrix is close to my heart. I worked for four years on a, on a game called The Matrix Online. It was a brutal, soul-sucking, crunch-till-you-munch uh, affair. Um, I'm proud of the technology, but it clearly shipped far later than it needed to and never really met with uh, too much success. Although, I mean, huge thank you to the tens of people that played the online game. Like, you know, still a fan of yours. In better news, Ascending Empires is one of the oldest flicking games I own. It has been out of print. It's been literally decades now that I have waited, and it's finally coming to fruition again in a reprint. A reprint that will solve a couple things, like the board being warped and making it hard to play, uh, maybe adding in some, some in more interesting 
uh, improvements to it over the years, but I love flicking games. Um, Ascending Empires is kind of the granddaddy of them. The other ones I like, uh, I, you know, I like the, the flick em ups, you know, the Western ones, but the one that really was the best was Seal Team Flicks. That one still, still warms my heart. So that's it. That's all I got. Let's get to question of the week. All right. This has come up, and this has actually come up as a result of some newer people going, how long do you play a game before reviewing it? And, um, you know, or, and, and it's, it was a general question. It wasn't like an accusation. It's more like a general question. How long should people play games before reviewing them? And the answer is always that faded, like, cop-out, which is, it depends. For me, it depends. I think um, that it makes sense to play. I will play a game enough that I feel like I can give an informed opinion about the game. When I feel like I can give an informed opinion about the game and what I feel about it, that's the line. And that line changes because some of the games, like, I'm not going to spend 100 hours playing Zombie Dice. I'm going to know how it plays, whether I like it or not, the pros and cons, in, in, you know, in a few games of it. Others are not so much. Campaign games get tricky because... On the one hand, you know, you know, there's the 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 Aryans. You must finish every game, and you must like master it and know it and, and and stuff to be able to really give a real opinion. And I'm like, nah, I don't agree with that. In the same way, I don't need to be a cinematographer to know whether or not I like a movie after watching it. You know, although movies, you watch it once, you get an opinion. Games, you want to play more. There's more going on. There's more facets to it, and so that's not entirely the best analogy. The um, campaign games, though, I feel like. There needs to be. Um, it, it, it's hard. It's hard for my contemporaries, some some of my peers who try and do this for a living, because you you have to hit the hotness. You have to get the games coming out. You have to review them. You have to get the momentum. You got to get the hits and likes and momentum going on. Uh, and it's not possible for someone to to be unless they really go. This is my lifestyle. Sit down, play through it all the way through. Some of these games and then be able to form an opinion and then get to the next game. That's one thing I like and why I will never ever be a paid for and will never do any money thing. I will I, I like it, subscribe, I don't care because I'm just doing this for fun and that gives me the freedom to be able to go, you know, I'm going to stop and take a bit of a break and play this game a lot more than I would play the others because I'm enjoying it versus, um, you know, going, okay, I got to get this done and get this out there so that I can get, you know, hit it at its zenith of interest and I don't, I don't envy those people having to do that to try to make a living at it. I just, this is just for fun. And so, a campaign game, though, if I play a few sessions of it and get a general gist of it, I'm going to review it in regards to feeling like, okay, this is what it is. I think there's a place, maybe I'm wrong, if there's, I think there's a place for some channel somewhere that does, you know, always finished reviews or something where someone goes all the way through it. Because like a video game, you can play a lot of a game but then you know that but then you find out that the developers you know cash was low and so they had to cheapen out in the end game and so the last few levels are you know you can run into that generally speaking you don't but it is possible but that is a caveat of being able to play like hey like i i'm playing i safari and guard i'm going to probably play 20 25 hours of it before i give you a review if i finish this game i'll see you next year um, and so, you know, that's an example. That's just kind of my, my philosophy and my mentality on that, because I don't think there's a hard and fast rule for every game, um, you know, that, that has to go like, you have to do, you, you have to play it 17.5 times. If you don't play it 17.5 times, your opinion is crap. Um, yeah, not everyone says that, but you have the extreme. You have the, I played it once just to get it done. You know, I mean, there is that extreme. I'm not going to lie. There are even, even veteran developer, uh, veteran reviewers that I've seen that like, they play a game so fast, they miss a rule. They don't go back and modify that or, or you know, or something, or they play it so fast, they miss out on it. And then there's one, you know, then there's ones where like, I don't know who, I would love to know if there's any, any um, reviewing site that goes through in a game start to finish no matter what, um, in, in, in campaign games. Now, in regular games, you know, if you get a Euro game or whatever and you're, like, really understanding, I don't know, how long did I have to play Revive before I decided I loved it? Well, I loved it after the first play. I haven't done a review on it yet, but I wouldn't, I, because I, it was a first play, I'm going to play it again, I'm going to try different factions, I'm going to do some things. I mean, just, I kind of just let the game decide based on how complex it is and how much depth there is to it, how much I should look at it in a review. Maybe, maybe that's a philosophy that a lot of people think should be modified. I don't know. Um, 
Now, the one thing I will say, and then I'll get off my soapbox, if I'm going to give, and I don't do this very often, I don't give very many negative reviews because I generally don't play games I don't like and I don't buy games I don't think I'll like, um, but I am surprised sometimes. Some games just come out and they're complete crap. Maybe three of the reviews I've done of the hundreds of reviews have been just demonstrably negative. Um, but if I'm going to give a negative review, and it's rare, um, I'm going to make very, very sure that I'm dotting the, the um, T's and crossing the I's as far as my knowledge of the game and understanding the rules and really making sure I didn't just have a bad day, um, you know, uh, you know uh, yeah, a bad, a bad hair, harebrained game day. And some of the games I'll actually set aside for a year and come back to and just revisit it after a year. I've done that twice now with games. The result was the same, and then I've done it with a game that the result was almost the opposite, so it happens. But, um, but if I'm going to give a negative review, I'm going to be very, very sure that I've given it a fair shake because I don't, I don't do video, I don't do board game reviews to go, you know, f puff myself up by bringing people down. That's just not my mindset anymore. It used to be. Long story. Someday I'll explain when I did video game reviews back in the in the 80s and 90s. Um, but that's not my my idea now. But uh, you know, up you know, always up for for discussion. How how long do you think people should play games before reviewing? Should it be you know that uh, you know scaling difficulty level like some games have, which some video games have, which is like yeah, we'll just raise and you know raise the amount of time needed based on the game and the complexity and the situation, which I think is the only fair way to say it. Because if I put hard coded rules in there, it just it just isn't going to apply to a lot of games because of the vast difference in, in the games themselves. So that's it. That's my question for the week. Now let's get to playing, reading, watching lately. Okay, what am I playing lately? Well, this is an easy one because I haven't had a ton of time to go play a bunch of games. Uh, as I said, like life has gotten in the way. There have been a lot of just unfun tasks that needed to be performed based on some previous not happy things going on. And that said, I did get a chance to get involved. Like the Isofarian Guard, I have played and played, but I have not even begun to play it to the scope. This is a game that was in my mind when I was thinking about how long to play before reviewing something. It is a 44 pound box of chocolates, and it is huge. And even just getting started and into it, I can give you some premonition that I really, really like, and that is that every like no no uh, stone has been unturned in in making this game as easy to get into and as pleasant and as presentation wise, it feels like a like a fancy steak dinner presentation. Um, but then again, I'm just starting it out. Maybe maybe it uh, maybe it tanks. I've heard it gets grindy in places. I'm gonna find out. The other game that I got that I picked up was The British Way. Now this is an interesting one that I've enjoyed because it takes the coin series, which is still my top most watched video is what is a coin game. So clearly there's an audience there. It takes that and it creates four little sort of min connected mini mini sessions of coinage there. So instead of having to learn four different uh, factions and all the rules and, and overlaying bots, which it doesn't even have, it takes a smaller bite-sized uh, Colonial Twilight, two-player only kind of coin was the only, was originally the only two-player only one. Um, and then uh, it takes that and it sort of creates these scenarios about uh, sort of a, a period of time uh, of decades in, in, in uh, Britain versus some of the colonial uh, places and, and the contention there and pieces them together in a very clever way. I'm very enamored with this. I'm matter of fact it's behind me on the table table over there. Hey I can point in the opposite way. And so I'm really excited about it because I think it's it's the the on ramp towards people learning coin that I that's that is outdone the coin games I've suggested in that regard before that, which is Cuba Libre and um and uh, Colonial Twilight, so I'm I'm excited about it. But again, I haven't played through it enough yet to say absolutely. Maybe I'll get to the last of the campaigns, and then there'll be like you know zombies and aliens that uh, attack Great Britain or something. I don't know. Anyway, what about video games? Well, kind of the same thing. I uh, I played about 23 minutes of Everspace 2. I uh, I had it on. I waited until it was out of early access so that and stuff and started on it and it, it looks really cool. It looks really awesome. 23 minutes in, I'm like, man, I wish I had more time for this, but I don't. So if you've played it, let me know. And then a game came out, uh, Red 
Red Dawn, Red Guard, Red Guard. Oh, I don't even. I think I blocked it from my mind because it was so bad. Um, but uh, it was the game from the people that did uh, Dishonored and and uh, some of the other really cool ones. Prey, I think, and it sucked so bad that I went. You know what? I'm just gonna go back and see if I remember Dishonored. And this is the first time I've ever gone back and replayed a game again. I generally don't. I'm like one and done. If I play through it, I'm done. This is the first. No, that's not true. I also did that with Skyrim, but that's because I wanted to see all the cool mods in the 12 years. But, but I'm so I'm currently playing, you know, 10, 10 minutes a day at, at Dishonored, uh, which is vastly superior to the game they just came out with, which is trash. Anyway, as for books, I'm reading a book now called The Unseen Realm. It's a uh, it's a biblical book that I'm that kind of goes over a, a different perspective on the spiritual realm. And uh, that's the book I read, and then I'm still reading Data, data Oriented Design uh, because it's becoming much more applicable in, in video game development than it used to be. And uh, actually, it's, it has applications in more than just video game development, but it's very intriguing. So, And then TV shows. What have I been watching? Well, I finished, I watched Gotham. I, I, I'm like, I never really got into a lot of it before, but I watched Gotham, and because I was able to watch it while I was doing a bunch of work, because a lot of this was manual work that I had to be doing over the last couple months, I was able to just kind of watch it through, and I'm like, the first, like, one, two, three seasons were great, the fourth season started to get really hokey, and then the fifth season it was like a major rush job, which happens all the time, it's like, I, I never watch series unless they're done for sure. But then when I watch them, I'm like, yeah, I can see why you guys are getting rushed to the end. It, it just got silly. Uh, but, yeah, there's that. However, I did start watching one called Fringe, and I'm only about eight episodes into that one. And I'm like, eh, this looks like your standard procedural, you know, quasi-wacky. So, again, mindless numbing chatter. What should I be watching? I, uh, I would, I'm all up for ears on that. So, with that, let's get into Tumbleweeds of Time. The year is 1974, and in, what do we have for famous birthdays in 1974? Well, Robin Williams, consummate, like when he, when he made you laugh, he made you laugh, and when he made you cry, he made you cry, so miss him, miss him terribly. Famous deaths, Jack Benny, Rochester. Nobody even remembers that in my era, but I had to grow up with really old parents, and they wouldn't watch any movies that weren't black and white, and so it was all about the comedy back then. And now, looking back on it, I understand why. That was some, like, that comedy back then was amazing. It was comedy. It wasn't mockery, and I really appreciated that. The other thing about comedy back then is that it was really, really self-deprecating. Yeah, there was, you know, there was jokes and stuff, but the ability to, to, to make fun of yourself and have people laugh because they see in you some of themselves, brilliant. It's just, I miss it. Um, popular slang term in 1974 was gotcha, short for, for got you, which apparently it dates that far back. Gotcha. Not as far as back as Napoleon or Wellington. Gotcha. <laughs> anyway, a uh, popular fad were mopeds. Mopeds are basically um, uh, castrated motorcycles, according to my son, who's heavily into motorcycles. But mopeds were great because at the time, my dad got one to get to work and back because we were so stinking poor. And the energy crisis in the 70s and... Like it was crazy, so he he'd get a little moped and he'd get up an hour earlier and to work and back. I still remember that. And I actually drove that. We had that for years. I actually ended up just driving it around the neighborhood for fun, for years. I um, actually missed that moped. So anyway, popular pun was um, the popular pun. Okay, maybe not pop. Popular joke, not really a pun, but uh, you couldn't make blazing saddles today. Because if you did, people would say, hey, Mel Brooks already made that movie. Yeah, didn't say they were quality. Top song was The Way We Were by Barbara Streisand. And the best sci-fi movie that year was Young Frankenstein, which I still have yet to actually finish. Did I miss out? Did I? And as for the weirdest story... In August of 1974, the public library in Upper Arlington, Ohio, 
added scratch and sniff since to its card catalog. Now for those who don't know, a public library is where in the old days you would walk in and there would be these books. They look like scrolls, but they're much, much better organized. And they had card catalog. Anyway, we all know that. Um, they, they called it the stick your nose in the card catalog program. The idea was that the card in the catalog would have a scent and uh, the corresponding book on the shelf would have a matching scent. So in the end, it kind of all makes sense. So you could find your gar books by smell, and they were like 60 cents. You could have apple, chocolate, garlic, lemon, clover, cheddar cheese, pine, leather, smoke. Either way, I don't think it was that crazy of an idea. I actually think, like, maybe they should do that. Maybe instead of, like, that whole, you know, Pokemon Go thing, that should be what they do. Like, you have to smell your phone and then go find something that smells like it. I could have fun with that. And the popular board game of 1974 was Connect Four, a game that to this day still is selling like hotcakes for young, young audiences, and even had a couple versions. If you liked it, check out Fairy Tale Inn, which is a re redo of uh, of Connect Four that actually I enjoy and like. So, and finally, the most important question of all: How many Aardvarks lived in the suburbs of Nashville in 1974? And the answer is zero. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Apologies again for the long delay. Life happens and I get back as I can, but looking forward to hearing in the comments how you guys are doing. Take care and we'll see you next time on Hairbrain Games.